Hey everybody, this is Cameron from Obnoxious and Anonymous, and welcome to the Twin Peaks Thought of the Day. Today is Sunday, April 16th, 2023. My guest today is Glenn Allen, and he was in charge of the video and audio production of the Twin Peaks Festival uh, for many, many years until it's... Um, uh, closure in 2019. He also runs the YouTube channel Twin Peaks Fest videos. If you have not checked those out, please do. Um, it goes back all the way until 1992 <laughs> uh, when they premiered Fire Walk with me in uh, North Bend. And uh, so many great memories and a lot of great, uh, you know, um, actors from the show that sadly are no longer with us. But uh, so definitely subscribe because you'll be taking def a trip down memory lane. Even if you weren't at the fest, it will bring back a lot of uh, memories just from your own experience with the fandom. So Glenn, thank you so much for joining me. I really, really appreciate it. You bet. It's nice to finally meet you. Absolutely. So, um, and likewise. Uh, so let's start with how did you discover the work of David Lynch? Okay, that's pretty easy. Um, I was aware of uh, Elephant Man. I was aware of Dune, but I didn't know who the director was. Uh, didn't know about Eraserhead. Uh, and then I'm watching uh, Siskel and Ebert do the review for uh, Blue Velvet. <laughs> and they're just tearing into David Lynch, accusing him of portraying violence against women and all of this and how terrible it was they're beating Isabella Rossellini up on screen and and I'm like what what is this what's I had to go see that movie <laughs> because of Siskel and Ebert so I know who David Lynch is now and I went and saw Blue Velvet and uh it was a little creepy but uh it drew me in you know so then um couple more years go by and uh, Twin Peaks comes on and I'm aware of it. But I had a night shift job at the time working at a paper mill in Sacramento. And uh, I think there was only one episode I actually saw. Uh, it was season two when everybody's hands started shaking. Right. Towards the end. Yeah. And I just, I didn't know what was going on. So, you know, uh, the show is done. Fire Walk With Me came out. And uh, I started renting some of the tapes at Tower, Tower Video. And I went, wow, this is, this is amazing. And uh, a friend of mine had a few copies that he recorded off of, uh, oh, the ones that had the Log Lady intros. Uh, so when it aired on Bravo. On Bravo, yeah, we watched some of those, and I went, "Wow, this is so, this is great." And uh, I, I bought the entire set. Let's see if I can grab it over here. Hang on. <laughs> I didn't get the box, but I got the whole, the whole video, videotape right. collection, right. and Firewalk with me. And I, I recorded the pilot that after I rented it. I, pirated it <laughs> so it was a little confusing it had i didn't see the original ending of the pilot until uh years later okay so so now i'm i'm heavily into it through the through the videos and uh, i'm i'm reading like a film threat magazine after fire walk with me and they they ac actually mentioned where the show had been filmed and uh, in 94, uh, I got laid off from my job. So I decided I'm going to move up there. I'm going to go up there and, and find the woods. And uh, I want to be in that environment. So uh, I was going to go to this uh, look for work in Wenatchee. I, I got up to the Portland, Oregon area. Oregon. <laughs> All right. And uh, I traveled to Wenatchee to try and find some work that didn't work out, but I did 
swing through North Bend on my way back home uh, to Portland. And I found, uh, I found uh, the Double R Diner and I found a few other filming locations. And that was great. Everything still looked pretty much the same after Fire Walk With Me. And then in 97, uh, I brought my fiance and her daughter back up there. And um, there was a little uh, gift shop called uh, Alpine Blossom, I believe. And they had a lot of merchandise that was left over from the ABC years. Uh, I got a, have you seen this man Bob shirt? I got a Twin Peaks physical ed department shirt. And I, they had a map that showed where some of the other locations were. So we went up and we found Runnut's Bridge. And uh, back then it was inaccessible. And we found the sheriff station and the mill was actually still operating at the time. There was still smoke coming out of the smokestack. We found the train car that was in Fire Walk with me that has since been moved. We found the big log. We found uh, the Continental, which was the filming location for the Roadhouse. That was closed. And uh, so, yeah, 97, we, we went into Tweeds before it caught on fire. The counter was still there. It still looked the same. Had a cup of coffee and some cherry pie. <laughs> So then, uh, so then I get my first computer and I get on the internet and I, I start doing searches for David Lynch. This is around 98 probably. And uh, I found the David Lynch web ring, which had links to uh, Dugpa, you know those guys? Um, mm -hmm. He had a campaign to try and get the deleted scenes for Firewalk with me. It started way back in the 90s. Yeah, I remember. And in a lot of these like Geo City type web pages, uh, there was one called Glossomary, Glossomary Grove, uh, where you clicked on it and you sort of went into the Black Lodge and tried to get out. It was kind of neat. <laughs> and one of these uh, links was to the Twin Peaks Festival. So I click on it and it's, oh, wow. They do this thing every year. Celebrities come and, oh, wow, you could meet the log lady and all this stuff. So I told my wife about it and uh, said, yeah, we're going to have to go one of these days, right? Because uh, my wife became a big fan of it because we sat and watched those videotapes over and over and over and over again. So jump forward to uh, 2008. And it's a quite, a, quite a long time afterwards. Yeah, we'd always intended on going, but we just uh, hadn't gone around to it. And then season one. Right. Without the pilot. Um, right. But I figured, oh, my God, it's actually coming out on DVD. It's going to look so great. Mm -hmm. And it so did. I said to my wife, I said, uh, we got to go. Now we're going to go because things are going to start happening. And I was right. I was, I was a little bit ahead of it so uh, we go to the festival and uh, it was still really small it was um, I think 86 people in 08 it was still at the barn in the woods it was hot um, it rained at the picnic on Sunday <laughs> and uh, it was very small. Um, I met Josh. I met a lot of the people that ended up on the gold box later on. I said, oh, I, I know that guy. <laughs> so uh, 2008 in particular was different because uh, uh, Don Davis was supposed to be there. And he had just passed away, like not even two months before the festival. So when we were all there, uh, um, Charlotte Stewart's there, and Kimmy Robertson's there, and uh, it, it felt like a wake for, for Don Davis. And I was able to speak with his, you know, his uh, character wife 
about how how much it meant to us, uh, how we how much we looked forward to seeing meeting Don, and it, it was very personal. It was uh, it was bittersweet. It it felt like we had been uh, taken part in something that was very intimate um, at the time. So that's that's sort of how the how we dipped our toe into the the waters of the Twin Peaks Festival. After that initial weekend, um, and you're going back home, what was your uh, thoughts about uh, about the festival? Were you like, okay, we're going to just do this every year now? Yeah, it was a conversation with Charlotte. Um, what I didn't know was that the, the festival had been sort of slowly dying mm -hmm. since uh, the early 2000s. And well, it makes it, sense. It was, I mean, David Lynch had even said when he was on tour for Mulholland Drive that Twin Peaks was dead as a doornail. Um, and so you're you're dealing with, you know, a decade past Fire Walk With Me. Um, yeah. I've, I've talked about in the past where I went up there in, what, 2000 three and nobody up there was even acknowledging the show's existence anymore and i thought all right well i guess uh everyone's just moved on so it, in it, fact it, i i i would go into tweeds and there was people working there that never even heard of the show which back then so uh, what, yeah and from what i gather it wasn't until the show hit netflix and then the gold box dvd set came out that that's when it all got renewed because instead of it just being a distant show that you once heard about, it was readily available on Netflix, including the pilot. So, well, I want to back up a little bit. Um, that year also was uh, Piper Laurie, which was the only, one and only time that she she attended the festival. I got to sit down and talk to her. Um, She's she told lovely. me about how her first movie was with Ronald Reagan. Yeah. She played Ronald Reagan's daughter or something like that. And uh, so it was really, uh, you know, you got you got close. You could hang out with the people. Uh, you got to meet really cool friends, uh, new friends, festival diehard David Lynch fans. And after that conversation with Charlotte, she said, well, you got to come back next year. And I said, OK, we're coming <laughs> back. So um, 2009. Uh, Carl Striken, the giant, the fireman, and Charlotte Stewart, Kimmy Robinson. And that was it. It was even smaller. I don't even think there was 80 people that year. And we still hadn't gotten a bigger venue. Uh, we were at this place in Fall City, uh, Masonic Lodge in Fall City, in between the barn and the woods. And then we got into a, a Civic Seder Center starting in 2010. Uh, so this is still the previous uh, festival organizers. Uh, and uh, like I said, that 2008, 2009 went by and then 2010 is when uh, everything had been out on DVD, uh, is now streaming on Netflix and Amazon. And uh, the festival started selling out. It didn't sell out right away. But it was a full festival from then on, starting 2010. At this time, are you still going primarily as a uh, attendee of the fest, or are you already uh, working on the uh, audio and video aspects of the fest as well? How'd that come about? Well, I started bringing my camera from the very be beginning. I was filming the Q&A in 08, just on my own, kind of a fan thing. And uh, yeah, I did that all the way through. If you go to that YouTube channel, most everything after 2008 was done by me. Okay. But it, I was just it, doing it. I have to just say, this is a great, as I said at the start, this is a great uh, channel to check out if you're a Twin Peaks fan because there are there's a lot of videos on here. And uh just all great stuff. Um, you even have just stuff from, from, like I said, all the way back, even though you weren't there, the 1992 
Fire Walk With Me premiere is is on here. It's fantastic. That just to hear uh, Frank Silva get up there and talk and answer fan questions and do his little bob moves, that's such a treat to be able to have that video and to be able to, to watch Frank and uh, as sweet as he was, you know, interacting with the fans. But uh, uh, that, that channel didn't happen until I became staff which was uh, 2013. So uh, the previous festival organizers, uh, after 2010, 2010, we had Jen Lynch and uh, Sherilyn Finn. So we're like, now we're starting to get, get some bigger names. Uh, Charlotte and Kimmy had kept this, this fest going for many years. They were the, the true heroes from the cast who helped keep that festival alive. And I can't say enough about Kimmy Robertson and Charlotte Stewart. I just love them to death. And if they see this, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for helping keep it alive. So uh, 2010, uh, we're getting a few more people. Uh, we're getting like four or five cast members now. And uh, 2011, was the 20th, 20th anniversary of uh, Firewalk with me. They actually got Cheryl Lee and Ray Weiss to come to the festival, which was amazing. Uh, and now, now, those, uh, now those two are inseparable. They're like at every convention that you can think of. Uh, and they're always doing these Firewalk with me Q&As now, touring the country with that movie. So it's, it's, it's come a long way. <laughs> Yeah, I believe we had Lenny, who played uh, Harold, and uh, Phoebe, uh, who played uh, Ronette. Mm -hmm. They were all there that year, I believe. And I think Jared and Amanda felt like they had done everything they they wanted to with the fest, and they were ready to hand it over. Uh, so they did one more year after that. And then uh, there were two... Two married couples who were approached who had been part of the staff for many, many, many years, part of the volunteer staff. And uh, the new festival organizers took over in 2013 and they lived locally. So it was uh, it was much more easier for them to to go up and do pre-festival uh, organizing after that. Uh, 2012 was Mike Horse. Uh, Al Strobel, and uh, I think we had uh, Kathleen Woolley, uh, Lucy's sister <laughs> from Twin Peaks, and that was the last year from the previous administration. So, 2013, uh, we got new organizers, and I was approached about being one of the volunteers. And um, it was a great opportunity to, uh, to have some creative input, uh, whereas I'd really never had that before. You know, like just for example, we had lots of merchandise, so we were always brainstorming, trying to come up with new ideas. And my idea was to come up with the Deer Meadow sheriff station patch well, we took screen caps of, of uh, deputy cliff <laughs> <laughs> we zoomed in on this and uh, some people on the staff mocked it up sent it into production and we made it it was like this the first time in my whole life that, that i come up with an idea and i'm actually holding it in my hand and this was such a a treat, you know, to be allowed to have that kind of creative input. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't sell well. <laughs> <laughs> it was a great idea, but they want the sheriff station. They don't want Deer Meadow. <laughs> so, yeah, um, we're coming up with ideas for merch and the merch pays for the festival. The ticket sales pay for the festivals. Uh, 
and uh, there, there was never any money left over. In fact, we were always in the red, even before and after we, we were always in the red. We were always spending out of our own pocket. Uh, the festival organizers, they took it to another level. They, they moved it out of the uh, Civic Center, or it was the uh, Side View uh, Community Center, I believe, which wasn't air conditioned and it was basically a basketball court and very echoey and very hot. Uh, but by, I think, 2015, we had moved to the country club and um, it was nice. It became a formal affair. People were dressing up, putting on nice clothes to, to come to the, uh, to the banquet night. So, uh, who was there that, that uh, first year with the new organizers? The first year uh, we had um, Jen Lynch came back and we had Catherine Colson, the log lady, who hadn't been there in a few years. Uh, she lived down in Southern Oregon. I knew where she lived, near Medford. And uh, she was doing like a, a Shakespeare festival every year. Yeah, that was that was happening at the same time. And so she couldn't break away. And if she did, it was usually just for one day. So she was there that year. She sang happy birthday to a, to a young gal. It was her 14th birthday. Catherine got up and sang happy birthday to her. It's it's in one of the videos if you look for it. Well, that's the and kind of lady she was. She was just, you know, super heartfelt and. Uh... You know, she's just uh, she was truly wonderful. I had an opportunity of interviewing her a year or so before her passing, and uh, just I could not say anything you know more nice about her than she was just an incredible uh, and wonderful human being. She would love the fans. She loved the fans. We found out uh, all the backstory uh, of the log lady, how it had actually been developed back when they were working on Eraser Hit way back in the day. And uh, it got incorporated into the show, and uh, she was she just loved the fans. And that particular year, um, we would do the table settings for banquet night. So every year there was a theme. If uh, if Nadine was going to be there, we would have like eye patches sitting on the table setting, or if. Uh, Hank Jennings was going to be there. We'd have dice, a pair of dice sitting on the table. This year, um, a friend of mine was <laughs> trimming branches at his place in Moala. And I said, hey, can you take some of those branches and cut them up about this big and uh, give them to me? And then we'll, we'll use these logs as a, a, a table setting for banquet night. So I got all these little logs and uh, sanded them all down. And I thought, well, maybe maybe the fans would like to have Catherine uh, sign the log. So I got them all cleaned up, smoothed down, put them on everybody's table. And then at some point during the q and A, I I suggested maybe we should gather up these logs and bring them to uh, Catherine and see if she'll sign them. So I went out to all the tables. I picked them all back up, put them in a milk crate. And she's sitting there sort of signing autographs in between the costume contest and the Q&A. And uh, we asked her if she'd like to sign them and uh, sign a few. But we didn't know until after we cleaned up that night. The next morning, we pulled that milk crate out, and she had signed every one of them. There was like 20 logs. Chris Matthews got one that, that she had signed all along the side of it because the bark was gone. But most of them, I've got one right here. Yeah, I'm curious. How do you sign a log? <laughs> well, like I said, I sanded them all down so that she could sign them. And uh, she signed it right on the end of the log right there. Oh, that's fantastic. And then so so now I've got... My log laid a lot, and the moss still grows. <laughs> <laughs> that is but, uh, that is really great. I mean, listen, I'm all for uh, merchandise you can get in a store and all that, but that is incredible and personal, and nobody else has that. 
Well, we had, uh, this became like one of the best prizes you could win. Uh, if you won uh, the costume contest, you got one of these. If you won the, um, I think if you won the trivia contest, you got one. And so uh, they were highly prized. Yeah. And then, of course, later on, uh, you know, we all know what happened. She she passed on. And we still had like 10 of these logs left. And it became a, a, a truly treasured item. I was more concerned about whether people could actually get these in their luggage and on an airplane. That's why <laughs> I made them like this. But, right. Uh, yeah. And then the, the few that were left over when everything came to an end, that was how I got mine. So I, I got mine that way after everything had come to an end. So it's not like you just jumped to the front of the line. <laughs> well, I like to I like to think that I didn't have any personal vested interest in something, but of all this Twin Peaks stuff, I didn't, uh, everything that you might see behind me, um, I didn't spend any money on this. This all came through the festival in some way. It was either a prize or it was something that, some kind of swag that I acquired. But that was, that's one of the best. That's uh, my first Log Lady story. So you mentioned Kimmy and Charlotte. Can you tell us about any other really positive experiences you had with uh, cast or crew members from the show? Uh, yeah, I went out and smoked a cigarette with Al Strobel. Uh, watched him roll a hand roll a cigarette one handed. Uh, got to ask him uh, about uh, the one chance out between two worlds. Is it chance or chant? And he said chant. So I got that straightened out. And uh, <laughs> Yeah, because when the show first came out, there were different books printing it in different ways. And everyone was confused because it made sense both ways. <laughs> so. Yeah, there's also... Uh, he talked about a deleted scene that ended up in the missing pieces where he's uh, putting the candles out backwards and saying fire walk with me. He reenacted that for us. That was amazing. And then I played it backwards <laughs> and uh, meeting Carl Striken in 09. Oh my God, the giant. Uh, he's in Star Trek, the next generation. He's in the Adams family. We talked about those things. Uh, he's even in Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band way back in the 70s. So that was great being able to talk with him. And uh, years later, after the show had came back, I, uh, I was fortunate enough to attend a private cast party uh, after the q and A. I got to sit next to the fireplace and talk with Carl. Some of the new cast members, uh, Deputy uh, Chad, Deputy Chad, that guy's a hoot. Uh, we had uh, karaoke night. One of the things that I brought into the festival, I brought, I started bringing my, my karaoke sound system up. And uh, let me see if I can show you this. This was our uh, songbook. This had all the music, and there's a uh, Leland Palmer karaoke night. He's back and back and ready. I'm ready. <laughs> there's he notes. So uh, that year, I forget the actor's name, the guy who plays Deputy Chad. Oh, John Pierocello. Yeah, he got up and just tore it up during karaoke night saying uh, girls just want to have fun. <laughs> and then we wanted to change. Uh, it got changed into Chad just wants to have lunch. Yeah. <laughs> so that was a lot of fun. So you were there at the uh, premiere night uh, for the, um, when they did the official showtime premiere of uh, season three. No. Um, uh it started airing before the festival that year, but 
that was also the year uh, Sabrina Sutherland came the first time. And we did a viewing party at the Roadhouse. Um, but we couldn't watch it from the broadcast. She had it on her laptop. And we watched it from her laptop. We got a big uh, HD TV set up at the Roadhouse. And uh, uh, Christabel was there. Uh, all the cast members were there for the viewing party except Cheryl and Finn. And that was the, the first episode that she shows up in the new, new series. Okay. It, you know, some actors don't like to watch themselves. No. No, I understand. So she wasn't, yeah. What was the oh, reaction? Chris. What was the reaction of the crowd? Of because um, I mean, you're you're at the festival. You're in the midst of season three. What was the vibe that year? I'm I'm, I'm going to assume it was probably one of the largest years of attendees. Um, but like, were people into season three? Were they kind of like not really feeling it yet? Like, what was the vibe of season three with the hardcore fans at the festival? <laughs> Well, I, I don't know if I had mentioned it yet, but uh, as part of the staff, I was in charge of everything that happened at the North Bend Theater on movie night. And uh, in 2016, they started showing those those little teasers where, uh, where Laura would go, I'll see you in 25 years, and she would go. And then suddenly a, you see the road sign, Twin Peaks since 2016. I played that at the movie theater that year. And the fans just went nuts. I can't imagine. They just, to see that on the big screen, to see it on your TV or on your computer is one thing, but we would put that on the big screen and they just went crazy. So, uh, yeah, that was the last year Catherine came. And at, at all of the cast members that were there yet, that year said we all signed a, a, a non-disclosure agreement but they hadn't even started filming yet so they, they we don't even have anything to disclose because we don't know what's going on right but um, yeah there was huge buzz huge buzz uh, it, we couldn't really expand it anymore because uh, the logistics to try and make it any bigger, uh, we would have had to have moved it out of the North Bend Theater. And the North Bend Theater could hold, I think, 275. Mm. So yeah, like you guys were talking with Ted, uh, it was about 250 and then 275, including all the staff, right. all the cast members and their plus ones. So about 275 was, was it. You just you, you couldn't get it any bigger than that. So it had to stay that way, especially if we were going to keep doing it at the North Bend Theater. Right. But, um, yeah, and then, of course, that was the last year we saw Catherine. And uh, we could see that she was ill. We, we, uh, we knew something was wrong. But nobody was saying anything. Hmm. And... Um, I believe Charlotte knew what was going on as well because they go way back. And uh, that was like the, the beginning of August that year. And by September, she was gone. She was gone. Yeah. And when I first, gone. when I first heard that, um, that David was able to shoot some things with her, yeah, because the Blu-ray set had remastered all the Log Lady introductions for, that they did for Bravo, mm -hmm. and and I had heard that they had shot her separately and privately from the you know the rest of the cast. I just naively assumed that they had shot Log Lady introductions for this new season and not had her incorporated into the show. Um, so I was rather surprised to see her not only in the show, but honestly, as much as uh, she was in the show more than I, I thought she was going to be in the show. I thought maybe she was around for the pilot or, you know, but then she kept showing up episode after episode for, you know, so I was really pleasantly surprised by that. Yeah. Obviously David had a plan. 
uh, he shot all of her little scenes first. I don't think he, they, they had even started on the rest of the filming yet. They they went to where she lived. Right. And uh, she had the log there. And uh, they were uh, mock conversations with uh, now Sheriff Hawk. And uh, Hawk was asked, or uh, Michael Horse was asked about that uh, during the Q&A after it had come back in uh, 2018 we had 26 cast members in 2018 that's amazing it was huge but he he talked about it and he reflected on how how brave Kathleen was uh we all knew what was happening and they made it part of the show it was it was amazing it really was amazing she gets her character her character gets like three finales I mean, she says goodbye with Hawk. Then Hawk comes in and tells everybody. And then we get the, the shot of the cabin and then we get the fade out. It's like three, the one out is like three separate, you know, goodbyes to her all in a row. Uh, which My is other one lady story involves uh, that last time she was there. Of course, she couldn't bring her log. Uh, you heard Ted talk about that airport security thing about the log but uh we did have like some of my firewood stacked up as you know little thematic things a stack of wood we had a log sitting in front of her that last year and uh, that was the time when uh, somebody asked charlotte what uh, what character would you have liked to have played uh, if you hadn't had you know got betty Briggs, and she said i always wanted to be the log lady and Catherine picked up the log and handed it to Charlotte. <laughs> and not really knowing what the backstory was yet. Uh, so we saved that log. And Michael Hor when Michael Horse came back, uh, I asked him to sign it. And I gave that to the festival organizers. I took a picture of Michael Horse holding the log. So it was as though... Uh, he got the log from the log lady. So that was what we tried to make it look like, even though you can tell it's not the real log. Still, though, the gesture uh, counts. It's, <laughs> that's very nice. Yeah, and it was very nice of him to do that, too, to sort of, like, do a post, like, I have the log now. So that was moving, yeah. So what was the reaction you had and like i said the uh the festival had at the time of when season three was airing did were people were were they really enjoying it at that point of the of the when it was airing because you're talking about episode 11 or 12 um when it aired at the fest or were people you know getting antsy like where's asian cooper <laughs> okay uh let me back up again when we had that viewing party right when Sabrina brought uh, that episode and we streamed it, we did. Uh, she was. Um, we were going to do karaoke right after that, so we had everything all kind of set up and ready to go. And she was sitting in front of the the, the HD TV, looking at her phone. And but she was pointing the phone towards us. Mm. So so she's sitting up there in front of the television before the screening, and what we didn't know at the time was that she was talking to David Lynch and she was pointing the camera at us and he was watching us getting ready to do the viewing party. Wow. And we found that out later. But um, getting back to where, okay, we're all watching Dougie, right? <laughs> right. How, how long is this going to go on with Dougie? That's uh, <laughs> like, Brutal, right? Waiting for it to pick up. And then uh, episode eight happened. Right. Look, the origins of, of the whole thing. Uh, the mother of all either, evil and the Garmin Bozia going inside of a nuclear bomb. <laughs> that episode blew my mind. It was, it was like a, a little mini, 
1950s horror film. Right. Uh, the Woodsman and uh, these guys, the Woodsman came to the festival. We had like four or five of the Woodsmans, including the guy that was going around crushing everybody's skull. And those guys hung out together like they were their own little thing. It, it was crazy. It, uh, you'd have all these cast members, but the Woodsmen all sat together. That was great. But the buzz was sort of like, uh, it was mixed. There were some fans that said, this is not the Twin Peaks I remember. And <laughs> um, for me, I kind of missed hearing uh, Angelo's music. There wasn't as much as that. Uh, the first two seasons, his type of that kind of stuff. Well, it's like wall to wall in the first two seasons and especially Fire Walk With Me. And then in season three, it's so uh, sparse. But what's interesting yeah. is you, you remember before season three, they did a whole like advertisement about Angelo Badalamenti coming back and composing, recomposing Laura's score and all that. So they made a point of showing Angelo prior to season three. So I thought, fantastic, right? We're going to get more Badalamenti music. And we did. It just was much more paced out. Yeah. Yeah, it was... Um... It, it became clear to me after about the first four episodes that David uh, David Lynch was not interested in trying to make it look like uh, what it was. He was he was making a today's version of Twin Peaks, and so you, you you're either on board or you're not. So I was on board. I was ready for the ride. I was strapped in. And, I also uh, I also think that because so much of the show of the of the new season took place took place outside of Twin Peaks, that that made sense for that. Yeah, it. I was a little disappointed that they didn't have more interaction with the with the some of the original cast. I, I would have liked to have seen more of, like for example, uh, Mike. Mike Nelson mm -hmm. and and more of Betty Briggs mm -hmm. uh, and uh, even uh, Donna's little sister. I, some people may not have realized that that was her, right. <laughs> Donna's little sister. But uh, yeah, I was a little disappointed in that regard. Uh, but there were other cast members like uh, Dana Ashbrook, uh, he had a great role. Um, Bobby had been redeemed. Uh, he was a part of the sheriff's department. He, you know, <laughs> I was transitioned. I was cracking jokes on Twitter the other day saying, yes, it's noble. Yes, it's great that he's part of the sheriff's department. But I also think there's uh, a little bit of Bobby wanting to make sure that uh, the killing of Deputy Cliff did not come back to get him. So he'd be in position to <laughs> get rid of any <laughs> information if it, if it came down to it. Yeah, and it was also kind of sad because him and Shelly weren't together anymore. And Shelly, for some reason, is always attracted to the bad boy, mm -hmm. which uh, I guess uh, goes along with her character. Um, it was great to see closure with uh, Hank and Norma. Or uh, not uh, Hank, but uh, Ed, Ed, Ed Big Norma. Ed. Big Ed. <laughs> Hank was killed off screen in a book. <laughs> so. Yeah, that was kind of sad. I, I thought that... He was I thought that he would have come back just because at the end of season two, when he's in the holding cell, they say that he's going to be going away for 25 years. So I thought maybe, you know, he'd be released at the same time, but it just, it it's apparent that David Lynch really likes the uh, number 25 because it's even in the international pilot, right. With her, uh, uh, where it says 25 years later when it shows the red. Yeah. Room. So. Yeah. Even though he, uh, uh, Chris Mulkey, the actor, didn't come back. He is involved in the uh, the audio book, the, the history of Twin Peaks. He's in there. Uh, he plays a character in there. I think David Patrick Kelly plays a character in there. Uh, also, I think the guy from Buckhorn, uh, the guy who ran the prison in Buckhorn, is is one of the voices on uh, 
the history of Twin Peaks, the audio book. How was uh, Chris Mulkey at the fest? I heard that uh, people really liked hanging out with him. He's, he's a hoot. I drove him around. Uh, you know, he's the kind of guy, he, he went to a military academy uh, after high, high school, somewhere around there. Uh, his old man sent him into a military academy to straighten him out. And he's the kind of guy that if he learns your name, He's not going to forget it. He's th throughout the three day festival. If uh, if he was introduced to you and he knew your name, he was going to know your name the whole way through. Uh, and uh, he was hilarious. Uh, somebody asked a, a question about Hank, and he acted like if you watch the Q and A video. This guy is asking a question about Hank, and he leans over to Kimmy and goes, watch this. And so he, he stands up and he takes one of the logs and throws it on the ground and goes, that's a bullshit question. <laughs> <laughs> he went right into character as Hank <laughs> and dropped the mic. Of course, it was my mic. Right. Oh, no, don't drop the mic. <laughs> <laughs> but Chris was great. Chris was hilarious. He, he's like, he's like uh, Bill Murray in a way. Uh, Bill and Brian Doyle Murray. It's like uh, he's he's like the third brother. He, he's just like those guys. Uh, he talked to me about living in Minnesota and and uh, how do you have cows in Minnesota when it's frozen all the time? <laughs> uh, yeah, he was great, and his wife was there. Uh, they got up and sang. Uh, I met Chris and I said, Chris, because he's got a band, you know, he plays like the House of Blues all the time. And I said, did you bring your guitar? And he goes, yeah. I said, bring it to, to the banquet. And I thought maybe he would just sit around and play. But he got up and, and did a show <laughs> uh, while we were while we were all eating dinner. Him and his wife got up and, and did this little cabaret show that they've done before. It was like watching Johnny and June Carter Cash performing. It was it was great. Uh, I got it all on video, uh, and then uh, unfortunately, his wife passed away uh, about a year or so after that, and so that that was a special treat uh, to have him and his wife get up and put that show on. Chris Chris is, Chris Mulkey is great. So you did the audio and and video all the way until the end of the festival, which was 2019. Uh, can you talk about, even though you first went in, in uh, 2008, can you talk about the changes you saw in the fest as the show got more popular? Uh, it, just in terms of uh, uh, perhaps the, uh, you know, like were the, you know, the attendees like, like how did that change? Um, cause we were talking about before how it was like, uh, there were like, you know, you had to be like a hardcore twin peaks fan to even be attending in like yeah. 2004, 2005, but now the show's getting really popular. So yeah. what, what's the dynamic? What's the change you see? Okay. So, uh, 2013, I've become part of the staff. And like I said, starting about 2010, we're, we're selling out every year. We're getting younger fans, uh, fans who weren't old enough to, to watch it uh, when it first aired, you know. Right. And in 2013, uh, we were still renting a sound system because you touched on the fact that I was in charge of that. So uh, the year after that, I went ahead and bought my own sound system because I figured – well, then we don't have to rent one, and then I could use it for my karaoke at home. And then I ended up bringing the karaoke to the festival uh, at the Roadhouse. But uh, uh, the things change as far as the festival changing. Uh, we were gradually upgrading continuously. I wanted to show you some as an example. Uh, in two thousand eight. This was your name tag, a little little plastic holder 
with a thingy that you would clip on your shirt, right? Right. By the time it was all said and done, we were we were doing uh, we had lanyards, and your ID badge was like this FBI badge that got a few people in trouble. <laughs> and the <laughs> lanyards are look at that. Are, look at that. Got a light. Got a That's light, good. and this one's got the festival logo on it, the flame. Wow. And there was another. There's another one that says, uh, "Let's talk about Judy." So anyway, <laughs> we're constant. We're constantly upgrading. Right. And uh, we moved out of that community center into a nice air-conditioned country club uh, instead of us having to go pick up a bunch of beer and wine and serve it ourselves, which was a pain. Uh, now we had a fully stocked bar with a bartender and. Uh, uh, you know, you can buy your drinks, but we, we didn't have to deal with that anymore. But you could get whatever you want instead of people uh, getting carried away drinking beer and wine. <laughs> and uh, yet when it's free, people tend to go a little overboard. Oh, yeah. I can think of a few attendees that probably took full advantage of that. <laughs> yeah, there was... Um, there was a, a, a fan who, who dressed up dressed up like uh, in the contest, the, the costume contest, she dressed up like one of the gals from uh, One Eye Jacks, uh, the gal that's running the vacuum cleaner. Okay. <laughs> she got a little carried away. Uh, we had to cut her off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can't, you can't be uh, intoxicated and pushing a vacuum cleaner. It's just not going to work. Yeah, there was a few times like that. Uh, 2008, there was a Ronette Pulaski gal that got a little smashed. <laughs> <laughs> it happens, you know. <laughs> oh, of course. Um, I would like to give you the opportunity to speak about a dear friend of yours that recently passed away, Mr. John Neff. I know yeah. you guys were very tight. And, um, and yeah. uh, so I wanted to give you the opportunity to uh, speak about him because he was somebody who made himself available to, you know, lots and lots of, you know, David Lynch, Twin Peaks fans. And uh, I have never met anybody who has ever had an unkind word to say about him. John was just a sweetheart of a guy. Uh, had the greatest stories. Not just uh, David Lynch stories, but great stories. He'd, he'd been in the music business since he was a kid. He was in a band out of uh, the Detroit area uh, that had a couple minor hits before he was even in high school. Uh, in fact, I think he opened for The Who in 66. He had a story of uh, Keith Moon's 21st birthday party. <laughs> he was there. The crazy drummer from the Who. Anyway, he goes way back. Uh, uh, my first festival, two thousand eight. He was there performing with his band, uh, Night Sage, and they were doing all Twin Peaks music. So I didn't know. I didn't know who John was. Uh, I didn't know anything about him. In fact, I didn't even uh, get a chance to speak with him that night. Um, but uh, backing up a little bit, that was sort of how. I got connected to you, how, how I found out about your channel because uh, when John passed away in December, um, I saw your little video announcing his passing. And uh, I said, oh, wow, okay, people are talking about it. And then I saw you and Josh Eisenstadt talking about it and uh, how Angelo and Julie and John had all sort of gone and uh, you guys were reflecting on that. And uh, I said, oh, wow, I can't believe this. You know, people are, are talking about John. So, uh, so now, uh, in 2008, John had, uh, he stopped working with David. Um, I guess he tried to uh, open a studio 
down in uh, Marin County somewhere, and he had some problems, uh, zoning issues. He couldn't get a studio built. He lost everything. He got ripped off. Uh, a bunch of his guitars and stuff were stolen. And uh, he was, by the time I met him, he had moved up here to the Portland area. He had some family in town. Uh, he was he was down and out. He was down on his luck. Bad times uh, for John. And uh, somebody had brought him up to the festival in, I think, uh, 2012. And uh, that was when I actually was able to speak with him for the first time. And uh, I, I sort of got the back history of what was going on. And uh, in 2013, when I be became staff, uh, I wanted to bring John with me because he could help me with the sound stuff. And plus he, he, had, uh, he had good Twin Peaks stories about remixing excuse me, uh, Firewalk with me, and uh, he had Blue Bob stories and uh, 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 other films that he had worked on. But um, John, uh, you know, he was still struggling for a few years there. And then uh, I think around 2014, uh, Christabel put out an album that had some of the leftover Blue Bob, unpublished Blue Bob music it, on Christabel's new album. So then John Neff got a paycheck and he was able to get out of Hawk. He got all of his stuff out of storage and he opened up his new recording studio, The Lab in Portland. And he got back on his feet again and he, he had his own studio and he had a, a, a lot of local bands that were coming in and recording that he was uh, in some of these bands. Uh, one of them was uh, Chris, Christy Joseph and the Purpose. That was the band he was playing in uh, up until the end. And um, he had he pretty much reestablished himself the same way he was in Hawaii, where he would record local bands that played in like some of the hotels. He would uh, he would record them and they would sell a CD in the hotel lobby. And so they were able to, you know, get decent sales for local artists. He pretty much did the same thing once he got the studio in Portland. So he was back on his feet. I mean, you know, he wasn't raking it in or anything, but he was he was doing audio for independent films. He worked with Josh. Eisenstadt on uh, more than uh, one or two of his films. And uh, he was doing fine. Um, and then in December, he, uh, he got very ill. Uh, he, had, he retired. He went ahead and he closed the studio down and uh, was in his uh, retirement community. He got sick. He got sick in December and... Uh, he passed just after Christmas, just heartbreaking. He was a good friend of mine, good friend of mine. He was able he to was. go to Florida, though, for that uh, festival. They um, it wasn't a Twin Peaks festival, but there was a lot of Twin Peaks uh, people down there. Um, so he was able to attend that, and I saw a huge group picture that he was in. So... I think uh, I think he knew by the time he passed that um, that he was very much appreciated by a lot of people. Well, yeah, because it had sort of come full circle. Um, John actually knew uh, Kyle McLaughlin, and every time Kyle would come into Portland to do Portlandia, uh, John would have an opportunity to meet him for lunch or something like that. That was that was a pretty cool. And uh, John would show up in, in, as an incidental character in some of these shows that were filmed in Portland. I can't remember them right offhand, but um, uh, he was staying active. He still had his connection. And then uh, when season three came out, 
uh, Twin Peaks of the Return, uh, they went ahead and they had music that John had co-written with David, uh, some of those Blue Bob leftover stuff, uh, stuff they did with Rebecca way back when, when she was uh, working on the uh, Mulholland Drive project. Uh, they brought that into season three, but they didn't. In the roadhouse, uh, Rebecca's up there singing, but the guy standing next to her is Moby. <laughs> it's not John Neff. So, but John, you know, John got paid. So it wasn't just stories about Blue Bob and mixing uh, the DVDs, the 5.1. He's actually part of it now, which was great. Uh, he, he, got, uh, he got included because uh, he sort of predicted that the way this Twin Peaks thing was going to be, it was going to be David's, uh, like, Mr. Holland's opus. Mm. Wow. Da David Lynch's opus, where he would bring in as many people as he could that he had worked with over the years and bring them all into this project. It did uh, kind of feel... Like, and I, I mean, I surely hope that David's able to make something else, but season three did kind of feel like a summation work in a way, because there were so many aspects of all of his films in this thing, as well as artists he'd worked with in the past. I mean, there's even references to Dune in, in it, <laughs> you know, when uh, Kyle's looking out over and sees the purple ocean, all that's very much like a, you know, yeah. Duke Leto. Yeah, and then shot. he's got he's got people from Lost Highway in there, and uh, yeah, uh, the way John Neff described it, he said this is this is the big hurrah. Uh, this is uh, that's the way he described it. I didn't think I didn't think so at the time, but uh, season three had come and gone, and uh, Sabrina Sutherland was at the festival for that next year um 2018 and uh the first question everybody asks <laughs> sabrina is when is season four coming out and she sort of just uh kind of looked and uh said well david's working on his memoirs and that was her way of saying don't count on there being a season four well, even I've said that it, uh, watching the finale and the way it ended, it felt very much like, all right, well, I guess uh, season four is coming up. <laughs> I guess. It, it, big, ends, yeah. it ends. And, and I mean, obviously. Well, David he, loves that. He loves he loves a cliffhanger. And then you can come up with your own ideas on what's going on. That's true. But when it comes to his movies. A lot of times, you know, if you look at the ending of the Blue Velvet or Wild at Heart or, you know, the, uh, the straight story, there is sort of a sort of a conc <laughs> conclusion. Closure. Yeah. Closure. Um, it's just because that last hour just goes in a different direction. Right. So it's just it's kind of, as I've said before, it kind of feels like the backdoor pilot to another <laughs> series or season, you know. Um, I mean, yeah, well, Sabrina, uh, I mean, I'm I'm shocked that uh, that wasn't the first thing someone asked her the moment she got off the plane. <laughs> so. I'm I heard a lot of people asking David that question. He goes, "Well, you know, we'd have to write it, and then we'd have to, and it would be a couple more years." And I'm just like, "Yeah, I don't think this is going to happen." In fact, if if you remember uh, when Cooper and Laura are coming back, or whatever her name is, down in Odessa, Texas. Mm -hmm. When they come back into town, if you if you recall, they're they're going past the Double R Diner, right? And it doesn't say Double R to go on the side, right? They're going they're going by at night. I'm going, oh, it's not there. So then they go to the Laura Palmer house, and the, the gal that answers the front door right. is the real person that lives there. Mm -hmm. So. So then it's like Chalfonts lived here and uh, this whole thing about Sarah noticing things changing 
wigging out about the turkey jerky. <laughs> uh, things had changed. Uh, and so Cooper's like, wait a minute, what year is this? And so that's it. They're, so, they're in another dimension, I guess. Yeah, that's the way it, it, it appears. I mean, if if Cooper does save Laura Palmer from getting killed, well, that is going to change the timeline and that is going to start shifting things. And that's why I think, you know, one of the things that people say about time travel stories is like, well, if that was always meant to happen, then how come we didn't see any evidence of that happening before? Because it, it was inevitable, right? But I think in season three, you do start seeing the shifts. Uh, you know, it actually makes Fire Walk With Me make more sense, too, because uh, a lot of people weren't happy with that film. But uh, the way they tied it in, uh, the story in season three, it, it actually made Fire Walk With Me, uh, made you want to go back and watch it again. Yeah. What's interesting is that Fire Walk With Me as being the final story in the saga like I really liked it. I did have some issues with it, but overall I thought it was a really good movie and I felt the ending was nicely bittersweet. When you get to season three and it's able to use the things that fire walk with me introduced the ring. Right. Um, and uh, Philip Gerard, Philip Gerard and, and, and uh, I mean, Philip Jeffries and, and all that. Yes. It, it, it allows fire walk with me to be a bridge to season three. So therefore it makes, it makes fire walk with me uh, stronger and better and feel more connected to the overall story, as opposed to what is all the stuff about the Al cave ring all of a sudden that came out of nowhere. <laughs> so. But also it brings to mind, uh, there's that scene where um, Cooper goes into that big teapot where yeah, uh, don't let Jeffrey David hear you say that. <laughs> David will not be happy with you. So he says, uh, I need to go back to 1989. And you see that little symbol change from the uh, the Al Cave thing to the infinity into into like a figure eight. Right. Uh, a loop of infinity. So that that clued me in that they're stuck in a loop. And that they're destined to live it over and over and over again. That's my interpretation. Right. And, and you know, at the end of Fire Walk With Me and season three, Cooper and Laura are stuck somewhere. They don't want to be, but they're at least together. <laughs> so they'll figure it out. Yeah. Yeah, I think that was the way. I think that's what David was going for. Um, I don't think uh, any definitive closure would have been satisfying for half the viewers but so he leaves it he leaves it up to you it's up to you what happened after that <laughs> all right all right so let's go to the final year of the festival 2019 it wasn't meant to be the final year obviously nobody knew about the pandemic was right around the corner yeah. uh, can you tell us a little bit about what that final uh twin peaks festival was like in 2019 Okay, so uh, 2017, uh, we've got new cast member coming to the festival. We're watching it during the festival. 2018, uh, we had a huge celebrity cast list of 20, 26 cast members uh, from the original cast and from the new cast. Now, it I just want to, let me just pause you right there. So for people who have been following this channel, um, we've touched on this kind of stuff in the past, but this is very important because in 2018, he's talking about there was a tremendous amount of people there. It's been a year after the festival. I'm sorry, a year after uh, season three has aired. The festival is now at an all-time high. They have all these cast members. Sabrina's there and all that. But it's also, um, what, six, seven months earlier, there's a whole bunch of like uh, accusations and controversies being thrown at the fest for, you know, all kinds of reasons. And so to have this much support 
for the U.S. Twin Peaks Festival at this, what I consider a very crucial moment in the fest's uh, life span. Um, that must have been really something because uh, we had a previous guest here, Ted, talked about how 2018 and 2019 were the two years where because of the, you know some of these accusations and and uh things being leveled at the fest the security had to be uh acquired for the festival so did yeah. that did that change things in terms of uh how attendees felt about the festival or you know was security just peripheral and it just was another part of the fest well i'll start by saying uh, even even as far back as 2008, I heard a uh, little bit of side chatter of people who thought that they could do the festival better. So it's not like uh, that was the first time that it had happened. Um, there had been those kind of discussions even prior to uh, me becoming part of the staff. Um, that being said, um, there were uh, there were some people who uh, mostly the mostly vendors who who would come to the festival and sell their own uh, fan made uh, art and uh, little things uh, that they knitted <laughs> and. Uh, you know, aside from us selling uh, festival merchandise, these these people had their own booths and they were able to uh, make money uh, on the side while being, you know, attendees at the festival. This group of people, uh, they broke off from the festival and they, they tried to do their own thing. But uh, ultimately, uh, for as much as what they were trying to do uh all he really did was open up tickets for other fans who otherwise wouldn't have been able to get them and uh they tried to have their little thing that that happened uh, uh coincidentally at the same time as our festival but that wasn't really, a co that wasn't a co that wasn't a coincidence i just want you to know <laughs> so. yeah it didn't didn't feel like a coincidence but yeah uh, the bringing in security was a precaution. Uh, we uh, we wanted to be prepared for whatever might happen. Uh, there really wasn't. Uh, it, it was. There really wasn't any kind of uh, incidences that occurred. And, and by the way, there was something I wanted to touch on that you uh, spoke with Ted about. Um, mm. There were never any contracts. Uh, with the cast members when they when they came, they didn't sign anything, uh, and nobody got paid. It was all just on good faith. Uh, if you could make it to the festival, uh, the step the fest would pay for their airfare, their town car, and their hotel accommodations, and it was like a a nice holiday vacation where you know you might have to sign autographs and things like that. Uh, if somebody couldn't make it to the festival, if one of the cast members had some work to go, they could cancel and it was no big deal. It, it happened many times, uh, but there was no contracts. So it wasn't like they signed some sort of an agreement. And so when, when this alternate event started happening simultaneously to our festival, there was discussion of trying to bring some of the cast members over there mm -hmm. and uh it was it was discussed i think among uh sabrina and the cast it's no uh, that's not what we're here for so for as much effort as they may have put into it nothing much came from it uh yes because it was uh, it was communicated to me that because some of the people involved in that alternative fest in 2018, they were 
in communication with some of the potential people that uh, were thinking of going to the U.S. festival. And then they were going to try and lure them over to not only maybe maybe play both festivals, but they really wanted to kind of snatch <laughs> those people and just have them appear at their own local fest. Uh, so I'm I'm happy to hear that uh you know that the buck stopped you know where it did and was the and and it was communicated effectively that um, no we're, we're here for this festival not this underground thing right i think they were just hoping for somebody to just like show up but it you know it didn't go the way they wanted and like i said uh it, there may be only a, a dozen or so of these people right but with with all the crap that was being said, it was probably more like a, more like fifty people stopped coming to the festival, in, including a couple of cast members who who just didn't want to uh, get involved with any kind of controversy. And uh, and there was, you know, even some of our staff uh, stopped coming. Um, but you'll notice that if you apply all these people you're talking to, you'll realize that they're all connected. They're all friends. They're all a part of this kind of hive mind mentality. Um, like you said, that some people don't go. Great. Well, then you get more volunteers and you get other people who show up uh, buying the tickets. I've, I remember even Jennifer Lynch took to social media. I believe it was Facebook. And she said, don't be telling me uh, that uh, I have a responsibility to bash the fest because I will not do that. I love the U.S. fest. I remember, I remember people asking her for comment. Right. And she did... Um, she stood behind us. She's a great gal. Mm -hmm. I got I got Jennifer's stories. Yeah, too. she was the first person I ever interviewed on this channel. So, uh, okay, uh, I'll give you one one story because I did movie night, right? Um, Jen comes one year, and she brings a video that her dad made for her for her birthday, and it had elements of the grandmother and the alphabet, and it, it had been edited with the song uh, All You Need Is Love in the background. And uh, this was obviously something you couldn't uh, put out there, but it, it was a, a sweet little personal thing that we got to see uh, at the festival because Jen brought it, you know. It was a, a real treat, you know. Uh, otherwise, I don't think anybody's ever seen that video. But but Jen let us see that. And it was it was great. Jennifer Lynch is uh, one of the most open, kind hearted human beings I've ever met in my entire life. The first time I met her, she was kind of uh, going through a bad time. She had just come back from filming that Hiss movie right. in India. And uh, it had been yanked out from underneath her and turned into something else. And uh, uh, she was going through a rough time. But uh, by the time she had come back a few years later, uh, she was getting, uh, what was the Walking Dead stuff mm -hmm. and uh, Wayward Pines. And she was, she was working and uh, things have worked out uh, much better for Jen since then. Oh, yeah. She even directed an episode of the latest Gossip Girl. And I think it was called. I, th I think it was like a, a playoff of uh, Fire Walk With Me it was the name of the title of the episode. And I thought that's hilarious, you know. But um, yeah, when I interviewed her, it was right in that in between time, like right before she started doing a lot of her current work. Um, yeah. So she had a little bit of downtime because now I, I don't think I could ever get her to sit down for as long as she did with me for an interview because she's just busy all the time. That's great. And it's fantastic. Yeah. Couldn't, couldn't happen to a nicer person. So. Yeah. Jen's great. Jen's absolutely great. Okay, so, so it's uh, good. Uh, I'm getting, where, where, where'd we leave off? I forgot. It's the, uh, 
well, we're, it's 2019 and you didn't know it at the time, but in retrospect, it was the last U.S. festival. Okay. Um, one thing I wanted to mention was that from the very beginning of when I started, every year we had a cast member that I had never met before. And I did this for uh, 12 years. So uh, 2018, we had the huge number of cast members. 2019, right. we went back down to being uh, about 10 or 12. And, still, that, uh, still, that's more than what was there in 2010. So, Right. And we had uh, Russ Tamblin was there that year and uh, Eric DeRay, who played Leo Johnson. I have a, uh, I believe this is, if you, isn't this the picture from that last one? That's, that's it. Right. That's it. Those so are all you... the people that were there that year. Uh, the girl over there by. Um, yeah, you have Zoe uh, over here. Yeah. See, so Mike Nelson, the... Zoe, Russ Tamblin, right? Eric yeah, DeRay. This... Yeah. This, this is, I'm trying to remember her name. Is it Adele or is it? Lu yeah, Adele, Lieutenant Knox. Yeah. Yeah. And there's John Neff. And a couple of woodsmen. There's John. Yep. I love that yeah. picture. It's a, and there's Rebecca Del Rio. It's a wonderful, uh, it's a wonderful picture. I was looking at it today going, well, everybody looks so happy. <laughs> Not knowing a yeah. pandemic was right around the corner. <laughs> if you could see that whole picture, I think Russ Tamblin is flipping you off. <laughs> <laughs> and you can so, also see the, this is at the country club. You can see the mountain behind him. It's just a, a great place. Yeah. Russ Tamblin so is making is, I just got to say, Russ Tamla is making lots of friends this weekend because he's at the uh, Turner Classic Movies uh, Film Festival. They're showing Seven Brides for Seven Brothers and Peyton Place, and he's posing with all the fans. And I mean, he looks in heaven. The fans look like they're just in, you know, uh, cloud nine. It's it's a, he's having a great weekend. Just got to say, we showed a clip of him uh, back in. I can't remember what movie it was uh, in the 50s before he did West Side Story, where he's just dancing up a storm, uh, dancing on a shovel, uh, swinging around on ropes and, and jumping out of a hayloft and landing on a, on a teeter-totter and getting shot up into the air. And <laughs> it's like, oh, my God, this guy was incredible, incredible dancer. And after we screened that and... Uh, he was getting in the van to leave the theater. And I said, I said, okay, tell me you had a harness on for that when you jumped out of the hayloft and, and did that teeter-totter thing where you shot up into the air. He goes, no, that was all real. <laughs> it was all real. Yeah. That was the last year. We didn't know it at the time. Uh, we had a chance to get... Uh, I'll back up a little bit. Uh, 20, uh, 2016, 2016, I think uh, Christabel performed at the North Bend Theater, and she performed again in 2017. And in 2018, Julie Cruz performed at the North Bend Theater. And then the very last year, 2019, Rebecca Del Rio performed. And uh, John Neff was my sound guy <laughs> for all of that. And uh, I had, uh, when Rebecca got up there to do her song from the uh, Twin Peaks of Return, John Neff got up there with his red blue bob suit, blue bob in Paris suit. And he performed that song with her live on stage and that was just a great feeling for me to be able to pull that one off. Uh, so yeah, that, uh, that last year, uh, we didn't know it at the time, you know, but um, Showtime had their own ideas of what they were going to do after that. And uh, it kind of hurt a little bit. It felt like the, the rug had been yanked out from underneath us. But, you know, they, they had their own ideas and they wanted to take it in their own direction. Well, I also think the pandemic played uh, a factor as well. So, Right. It, 
in fact, we would have lost, the, fe the festival would have gotten canceled and we would have lost a bunch of money. And it, if it hadn't been us, uh, them, it would have been us. So, so, so they look, can carry on the way they want, you know. Absolutely. So looking back, you know, you're th this casual fan who stumbles upon the videotapes of the show to the point that you go to the festival, then you become part of the festival. Uh, obviously, it's been a few years since you were a part of all this stuff. But looking back, you know, how do you feel about your Twin Peaks community experiences? Well, it's a, it, it's kind of mixed. Uh, at first, it was a little uh, kind of heartbreaking. Um, I was still doing post-festival work, uh, putting videos up, and you know, getting those all put together. And uh, when we got the word that, that it wasn't going to happen anymore, uh, I just sort of like stopped. I've got plenty of footage that I haven't put up yet. Uh, I'm kind of sitting on it. But uh, I didn't, I wasn't inspired to be that creative uh, anymore after that. Um, we all still stay in touch. We, we still get together. Uh, the fest staff for all of us that live up here. Um, uh, some time has gone by and, uh, you know, I'm not as active on social media as you might be, but uh, we, we sort of just put it behind us. It was a great time in our lives. It was very special, but, um, you know, our dreams came true. That's a dream that we wouldn't even dare to say out loud that, oh, I wish Twin Peaks would come back. Well, it, it happened. It <laughs> right. happened. It, it came back. And and we got closure. Um, what more could you ask for, really? Uh, we got everything we wanted. And uh, it came to an end. So... Uh, I have fond memories of uh, those years, but uh, that being said, you, you know, for me and my wife, instead of planning on this every year and all the pre-planning involved and all the work involved, uh, we don't have to do that anymore. And now we can go off and we can do other things. I mean, we can still watch the show, and uh, if Showtime is going to have another gathering somewhere, we could go if we wanted to. But it's sort of uh, at this stage of the game, uh, I'm a little bit older now. I'm in my early 60s, and I'm thinking more about what's ahead of me and uh, what I want to do in retirement rather than, oh, gee, I wish I could go back to the Twin Peaks Festival. It's, I, it's, I put it behind me. And I think for the most part, uh, a lot of us who were part of the staff have put it behind us as well. But, but you know, but we're you still do, friends, like I said. Right. And you have, you know, your Catherine Nicholson log behind you, which is <laughs> like, I don't know how much better it gets than that. So, yeah, it's, uh, it was a great time in my life, you know, and uh, I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. Well, I do hope that everyone watching does go and uh, subscribe to this YouTube channel. And I do hope that you eventually put up the footage um, at some point, because I think a lot of people will, would cherish uh, to see, you know, more of uh, everything that they loved about not only the fest, but the show. Well, there's a few things I, I'll mention. Uh, I haven't, I don't think I've put anything from 2018, that big one that had 26 cast members. Right. I haven't shown any of that yet. Wow. I'm, I'm waiting. I'm waiting to see maybe I might do something bigger with it. Okay. Um, I also have the complete performance of Julie Cruz in 2018. Um, that I shot and mixed. And uh, I told Julie, I said, look, if you don't like it, I won't put it out. 
and we communicated and she didn't like it. So nobody's ever seen it. I still have that stuff. And um, I'm contemplating whether I should put it out or not. Well, as a longtime fan of the show and everything, I think that um, especially since a lot of these people have passed now, Right. I think I think it's a wonderful memory, um, and an, and an honor to 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 show it. I mean, it's uh, I don't think it's um, being disrespectful because obviously it's you know it was uh, it was a very special time and moment for a lot of people, including them. And it was a, a once in a lifetime opportunity. Uh, uh, Julie had health issues, and uh, we didn't know how bad. Uh, but uh, you know, that's that's precious because uh, it'll never happen again. You know, it's very precious. I agree. Well, Glenn, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it, and uh, telling all these amazing, wonderful stories and. Uh, like I said, everyone go subscribe to this YouTube channel. Uh, you won't regret it. And um, it's been an honor, seriously, to not only meet you and get to know you a little bit, but to have you on the show. And uh, I do hope that uh, maybe you'll come back again and uh, we'll have uh, maybe a roundtable discussion with other, other fans that you are uh, familiar with. And I think it'd be just a great time but uh glenn seriously it's it's uh wonderful to have you here uh i enjoyed it and by the way i just want to say to all my friends from the festival uh i miss you i love you and uh i really enjoyed hanging out with you guys and uh nothing but good memories for those years all my friends from the twin peaks festival Love you all. <laughs> all right, everybody. Yes, I'd like, I'd like to get together again. Maybe uh, I can go over uh, some more of the stuff that I piled up here. Or we'll, we'll oh, get we'll get, well, well, why don't you give us one more for the road since we're here? Okay, one more. Let's see. All right. I've got uh, Charlotte Stewart makes these Miss Beetle bags. She made one for me. That's got Jimmy Scott in the red room. <laughs> and she even she signed it on the back here. Oh wow. But she she normally makes these ones that are from uh, Little House on the Prairie. They look they look more like this. Right. Be beetle bags. <laughs> but then this one I have, this is when the Showtime brought us up for a QA. And we all got, got to be part of the bonus footage on uh, the box set that came out that year. And uh, this was a swag bag that I got. Oh, wow. This this was actually a David Lynch thing. Mm -hmm. This Some of the new merchandise they were selling. We got, we got a couple of things inside the bag that I can't remember. They're all behind me. But these are my, uh, just a few of the things that I have piled up back here that we can, we can <laughs> talk about later. I am definitely looking forward to it. So again, Glenn, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. As uh, that. And everybody watching, make sure to give this video a big thumbs up and subscribe to this channel and Glenn's channel as well, if you haven't already. Also, be sure to follow us on Patreon, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, emails anytime at obnoxiousandanonymous.hotmail.com. Thank you again for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a wonderful day. Take care and bye-bye. <laughs>